Hi, this is Rex Fowler from the Newtopians, and you're listening to Things We Said Today. Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, a weekly show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show in which we focus on Beatle news, what's happening in the world of the Beatles right now. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show. Many of you know me for another Beatles program that I host, which is syndicated around the country called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many other Examiner columns, that being, of course, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everyone out there. On today's program, we have uh, yet but another special guest joining us on the phone. And it is James A. Mitchell. He is the author of a brand new book on John Lennon, which is called The Walrus and the Elephants, John Lennon's Years of Revolution. And it basically explores uh, John's time in uh, New York City, his political activism, and his involvement with the uh, band that he worked with, Elephant's Memory. And James, welcome to Things We Said Today. Well, thank you. Good to be here. and appreciate the time. Let's start just by asking a very basic question. I know that you're aware of much of what's come out on John on this very topic, his political activism. Uh, certainly a few years ago, a wonderful documentary called Lennon NYC. Uh, there was a book that Alan Weiner uh, put out back in the early 80s on this subject called Come Together, John Lennon in His Time. What does your book bring to the table that may not have been explored before? Well, a couple of things, I hope, um, and in part by focusing on a very specific story, which is to say, beginning with when Lennon caught the attention of the Nixon administration and their fears, and right about at that time was when he contracted or, or signed, you know, joined up with, and as he put it, the New York band Elephant's Memory. And together over that next year is the core of the story, uh, which ends when Lennon got his green card. So rather than trying to address too much, I was able to narrow the focus. Mm -hmm. The elephants have not been given too much attention, even though... They had a considerable output and a considerable percentage of Lennon's solo career. And then I hope the third part being, in addition to the elephants, uh, by having contemporary interviews with some of the known radicals, John Sinclair, Rennie Davis, plus other people from the time, like Gloria Steinem, it puts a contemporary look back on, okay, what was Lennon fighting for and what has stood the test of time? To get into what you said about the Nixon administration, I'm, there's a lot of discussion today about the NSA and, and uh, you know, what's been going on domestically. And my feeling is that there was a lot more paranoia and a lot more reason to be paranoid with what the Nixon administration did than, what, than anything that's happening now. And John, of course, was one of their high-profile targets. Do you agree with that, James? I do because there, and I'm not I'm not naive. I'm not saying that presidential administrations since then or government period is not capable of things, but it was a rare combination: Nixon, his inner circle, and uh, very importantly, the cooperation of J. Edgar Hoover. That they left no stone unturned. They wanted to leave nothing to chance for the '72 election. And Lennon's story is one part of it, and it's the same mindset that all the way up to Watergate. So where there is political corruption, there always has been, not quite as widespread, not quite as, as intensely paranoid as that particular group, and especially because it was so divided along generational lines. Today we have liberal conservative debates, but it was a very cut and dried youth versus, you know, the establishment sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the FBI had a whole dossier on on, uh, on Lennon, which which uh, Alan Weiner uh, 
uh, wrote about, um, you know, uh, detailed about. And, and that's very easily something you can get very easily on the Internet. And it's very interesting reading now. Real quick, those are out there, and I think it was John Weiner's book, uh, right. and his pursuit of getting those, uh, you know, I took my journalist uh, hat and salute the man for it. What was interesting was talking to some of the, the names mentioned in the FBI documents, like Rennie Davis, one of the Chicago Seven. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously the spotlight was on Lennon, but through these associations, it burned even brighter, and some of them are still around. So, Did this fear of John start around the time of, say, Give Peace a Chance, or was it more when the John Sinclair rally took place? Well, with Give Peace a Chance, obviously the more conservative minds among you know, Nixon loyalists just thought he was a disgusting hippie or whatever. With Sinclair, and again, there were a lot of timing went into it that Sinclair had sat in prison for two years, John Sinclair, a Detroit poet and activist. And when Lennon came, December 71, to Michigan, headlined the rally, yes, there were other causes that that led up to Sinclair being freed. Uh, Nixon lowered the voting age to 18, uh, ahead of the 72 election. And a lot of marijuana laws were being revised as... You know, candidates were trying to, well, what do the kids want? Hmm. When Sinclair got free, you know, all the credit slash blame went to Lennon, and it did get discussed. Uh, Strom Thurmond sent an infamous memo to the Oval Office pointing out, look, you know, this bear is watching. Lennon had said uh, several times they were planning a concert tour, step by step with the campaigns. And it was done for political motivations to try to deport him. So his influence was always known, but this was a concrete and directly, you know, he appealed to this young voter crowd. He appealed to this, you know, rally the troops sort of thing. So did he really speed up John Sinclair being freed? Because it was only a matter of days. Or you were saying the wheels were already in motion anyway? Without question, Lennon made it happen quicker because of a bandwagon sort of uh, thing. The state of Michigan was considering, you know, lowering, uh, reducing marijuana possession from then a felony to a misdemeanor. But because Lennon was on stage at Chrysler, suddenly you had uh, the Ann Arbor mayor stood up and read a speech about what a disgrace, you know, uh, I'm not sure if he had it read. The East Lansing City Council passed a resolution. So this this sort of bandwagon, oh yeah, you know, we're all behind this. And that came from Lennon, not from any other act on the stage that night. One of the things I found interesting in the book was, was the talk about the tour with uh, Elephant's Memory. Were you able to find a lot of details about that, like songs they were going to do, or and what what happened with that, why it didn't go through? Well, yeah, it was the great tour that never was. Uh, and the Madison Square Garden show in August of 72, uh, which was Lennon's only full-length uh, solo concert ever, um, the one show. I mean, he had done a few small appearances, three or four songs, but never a full-out show. And I think the set list from that was kind of what he had in mind. The solo quality hits, Imagine, uh, and a few others in there. It leaned on some of the music from sometime in New York City, which I think is, some of it's pretty underappreciated. And he wanted to give the elephants their day in the sun. The one funny thing is, and actually I think they all kind of shied away from it, he only allowed one Beatles song. He did uh, Come Together. Right. <laughs> and it's interesting, the band, to their credit, you know, most bands would be saying, we want more solo time or, you know, do the new material. They wanted to do Beatles songs. <laughs> they were absolutely fans. No, no, John only let one. He even said in the concert, we'll go back in the past just once. Yep, just once. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but even but it was interesting though that um, Yoko has said that they were talking about touring after Double Fantasy, and they were going to do they were going to do several Beatles songs, not just one. So well, by then time may have mellowed it a little, you know. Certainly by in '72, you know they were all trying to carve out their own sort of post beatle identity, mm-hmm. you know, and shied away from it. And in 72, the reason the tour didn't happen, um, it all went back to the green card. He was limited in what work he could do. He was here on a visitor visa. And if he'd left the country, they wouldn't have let him back in. James, Hmm. how big a role uh, did Yoko play in John's involvement with his politics? I just want to read a quote here that actually comes from John Sinclair in your book. He said, never underestimate the role of Yoko Ono in the transformation. She was already a leading figure in the counterculture in America, especially in the arts of the 1960s. Well, absolutely. And, you know, Yoko opened John's mind to a lot of things, uh, to include, you know, she was the one who, I don't know if coined, but made use of the phrase, for instance, woman is the nigger of the world. And it was early into Lenin's education into feminism. Um, And that's no small thing because it was so consistent with so many of of his other views. And he, like a generation, had to, you know, the the background before, you know, our fathers and the way they viewed women in society was what was passed on. And it took somebody to be willing to say, let me think about this a different way. And what people considered weird back then, uh, Lennon went for it. And also what in New York, uh, Yoko had lived in New York prior to that, uh, going back to the early 60s. And it's sort of, it, she knew a lot of the, the arts community, that lower Manhattan village, et cetera. And that helped part of it too. Certainly the radicals came to see John. Uh, Jerry Rubin and Hoffman. Rubin got in touch with Yoko, oddly, and the rest became history. I found, uh, well, let me bring up a couple of names, and and you can talk just briefly about them. One was A.J. Weberman, who I I thought it was amusing that Lennon did not get along with. And another would be uh, David Peel. Talk about those two guys um, and their involvement in this story. Well, uh, They definitely, you know, are other examples. Uh, Lennon met a lot of people when he moved to to New York. Everybody wanted to meet him. Everybody wanted to hang around. And he wasn't uh, restricted to just associating with the A-list or or the celebrity crowd or or whatever. Uh, David Peel had probably the most sustained contact and wound up being confused with Lennon later. Uh, Peel headed a group called David Peel on the Lower East Side, pretty much a Washington Square Park kind of player, not necessarily the greatest uh, musician, but earnest in his songs uh, being for the people. Lennon wound up producing an album called The Pope Smokes Dope, Mm -hmm. uh, which was one of Peel's. (laughs) He had another song just shouted marijuana over and over. Interesting guy. And he was around a little bit at first. In fact, a couple of guitarists from Peel's group backed Lennon at the Ann Arbor show and also at uh, the Apollo Theater in December 71 when Lennon did a couple songs at a uh, Attica State Prison rally to uh, benefit the families of the victims. So Peel was just, you know, a street character. A legend has it that you know, Lennon was walking around Washington Square Park. Peel was performing and made some speech about, you know, why should we have to pay to see celebrities? And <laughs> Lennon was just of the right frame of mind to think, you know, it must be me. And, you know, he really wanted to try to get back and just be one of the... St- I think he saw Greenwich Village as returning to his art school, hmm. you know, and, and the village... For anyone who doesn't know, has very much has that kind of artsy, anything goes community feel to it. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. where Peel came in. 
A.J. Weberman, pretty complicated story. He was a bit of a village character, a New York character, a bit of a, at times, conspiracy theorist, uh, perhaps. He certainly wondered about Bob Dylan's motives. He worried about Dylan, but then became suspicious of him. The, the He had, with Lennon, briefly, a common enemy in Alan Klein. Uh, Klein, it had been revealed in the New Yorker magazine, kind of ripped off George Harrison's uh, concert for Bangladesh. And so when Weberman and some others staged a protest on Klein, uh, Lennon got to know him briefly, but they weren't fated to last long. He kept uh, trying to attack Dylan, and Lennon considered Dylan a friend and certainly an inspiration, so... Just part of the parade. I mean, there were there were accounts, and Mr. Weiner had in his book some good ones. You know, the the number, the parade that passed through the Bank Street apartment. You know, John and Yoko moved into basically a no doorman, just the simplest of apartments in the village. And for a while, there were feminists, musicians, activists. They were just street people wandering in and out. What was the confusion that David Peel had with John that you were talking about before? If you, As you read through all of the FBI files on him when they were trying to put the surveillance together, it became almost a running joke. There were a couple of times that the field agents requested home office assistance in obtaining a photograph of John Lennon. In New York City, they couldn't come up with a picture of one of the world's most photographed men, <laughs> uh, which was funny as hell. They used a drawing one time. Well, heading into the August uh, Republican convention in Florida, the FBI put together a sort of be on the lookout advisory, you know, on Lennon, gave us stats. And the picture they used was David Peel from The Pope Smokes Dope. Uh, it was from an Apple release. Lennon's name was on it, probably as produced for the album. But but as I said, Peel didn't look like a beetle. Um, but he did have the circular glasses and long hair, so maybe to the agent they all looked alike. Hmm. That's, that's hilarious. Another name that was floating around there during that period was Geraldo Rivera, which, given what Geraldo Rivera is doing today, is is almost... Hilarious. Um, did you have any contact with him for this uh, book uh, at all? Well, I was unable to uh, get his time. Fox News must keep him busy, or either that or he was taking those drunken self photos there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Geraldo. But, you know, and, I, and when I'm, the name comes up, I have to remind people look, back in the early 70s, Geraldo was a great crusading journalist. And he was. In fact, it, it was his reports on a hospital for disabled or, or ill children called Willowbrook. Um, actually, it was called the Home for the Retarded Children at the time. Mm -hmm. The patient treatment was just horrible. It, it, abuses of the system, et cetera, and, and the patients. For all those report on it, he stole a key, he wound up winning all kinds of awards, exposed it. And the August 72 concert Lennon did, one-to-one, -one, was a benefit for Willowbrook. And he finally pulled it together, and actually they had a day of it. He took the patients and their families out to Central Park for kind of an ice cream social and did the two shows. Geraldo was big and part of that. Uh, I did see, and there's a section in the book, it just in early 72, late spring, early summer, John and Yoko went to the West Coast for about a week. They spent some time with uh, Paul Krasner, the publisher of The Realist, uh, but also Geraldo in San Francisco. And there's film footage of them spending the day going around in the cable cars, uh, taking a look at the bridge and all, and just talking about what he wanted to do after the Beatles. And they were sincerely involved, and that was when they began kind of planning Willowbrook and what it began, and what the concert became. I think there's a very young Steve in the background in that footage, if you look really carefully. 
<laughs> He's following John and Yoko around, so. <laughs> Before um, um, Elephant's Memory worked with John, some of the members, because they went through um, personnel changes, some of them were involved with politics. So, and and uh, how much of a part do you think that played in John choosing them to work with, or was it more just their sound that he was looking for? Well, the politics certainly provided the introduction. Uh, the two found main founders of uh, Elephants, Stan Brownstein and Rick Frank, they were, you know, they were into the, they were good buddies with Jerry Rubin. I mean, these are the kind of guys, they played strip clubs, <laughs> they hung out with the Hells Angels, mm. you know, and they did all kinds of political rallies, and a lot of their songs were heavily political. One of them ends with machine gun fire on the record. And that got them the introduction. And Elephants had had quite a few lineup changes. Uh, early on, Carly Simon was lead singer briefly. But they weren't really getting anywhere. The three new guys who had joined just shortly before uh, Lennon met them would be Gary Van Syak on bass, Adam Ippolito on the keyboards, and fresh from Detroit, uh, Wayne Tex Gabriel on guitar. And those three are rock-solid musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and what it added to the band, the politics got them the introduction, but it was the four-hour, five-hour jam session they had of oldies that got the gig. You know, they were a really good band. So you were just talking about that record with gunshots at the end. That that actually, how did that help John decide to to um, to work with them? Because you know John was a peacenik. You would have thought he wouldn't want to even hear violence at the end of a record. Well, and you know the the record with that kind of thing was an attack on the system, and it certainly was a harsher take on it. But I do think the fact that the band was immersed in, and had played a lot of rallies and was, you know, right there on the street, right there in the heart of the counterculture type thing, only helped because the the album that they had planned sometime in New York City, you know, Lennon wanted it to be, you know, what the word nigger is on the cover of the album. Uh, woman is the nigger of the world. The title is there. It looks like a newspaper for those who hadn't seen it. Uh, songs about John Sinclair, about the Bloody Sunday uh, riots in Ireland, uh, songs about Angela Davis. Mm. He was definitely pushing the boundaries. And after a lot of what he may have felt was holding back as a Beatle from being more definitive about the, the movement and about things that were going on, he kind of, you know, like a lot of people in Greenwich Village, when he moved there, he jumped in you know, full steam ahead. There were several significant TV appearances that John and Yoko did during that time. Um, the two that stand out, well, the, the three are Frost, Mike Douglas, and Dick Cabot. But the two that really stand out for me are Mike Douglas and, and Dick Cabot. Mike Douglas, because it was a such a it was such an unusual show for John and Yoko to be on, and for what they did that week and Dick Cabot, because it was just so deep and probing. But let me ask about Mike Douglas. You know, for people who aren't really familiar with the Mike, what the Mike Douglas show was, having John and Yoko on the Mike Douglas show was like having, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of somebody, um, Marilyn Manson on, on Ellen. I mean, it's it was that, well, maybe not that heavy. I know, what you're, you know, I know what you're saying, but you know what? Today... Mm -hmm. Even the most radical pop star is still in the entertainment business. I think, you know, it, it, they would do it. But you're right. I mean, the Mike Douglas show catered to the housewife brigade. You know, it was Stephen uh, Lawrence and Easy Gourmet territory. You know, mm -hmm. Douglas. And nothing against them, but you know, Douglas was of the very much middle of the road by his own definition. He said, "Call the TV light." Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a successful, highly rated. But the afternoon coffee break usually was. <laughs> you know, he he had, Douglas did have Martin Luther King on, but that's not the same as having one of the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. a major network show uh, out of Philadelphia. 
what Douglas said in his book was in the history of his show, and I think that was over 20, 30 years maybe, they had never given anyone as much freedom with the guest list as they did John and Yoko. And two of the choices, Bobby Seale of the Black Panthers and Jerry Rubin, probably wouldn't have been allowed elsewhere. Right. And it, that, that showed Lennon's cloud, and that's the elephants also, and more, you know. But there were other, there were other good things that happened that week too. Of course, the Chuck Berry appearance, which everybody has seen and has been, you know, is always mentioned. But that was very special, as you as you said in the book. How special was that for John? Oh, that was his highlight of the week. You know, he, he said to Douglas after it, you know, it made the whole gig worth it, huh? Um, and it was just such an odd mix. Um, and I, I try to imagine today, and when you mention what it would be like today, the interesting part in watching Douglas with Jerry Rubin and Lennon is that nobody was shouting over each other, not like most cable news forums do today. You know, there, there was no fake staged anything. It was just a, actually a polite conversation. And Bobby Siegel in particular impressed Mike Douglas just by laying out, look, you know, community activism and what the Panthers were doing. So it, it broke a lot of ground and showed a different side to what a celebrity might be pushing. Through the week, although he played a single, imagine, it wasn't pushing records, it wasn't he wanted to bring on the director of the Peace Corps. He wanted to bring on a civil rights attorney. I forget the woman's name. And talk about those things. It was quite interesting. I know. It's, it's so different for its time because he wasn't just hawking his latest product. Um, I do admire the fact that um, one of the other guests he brought on was George Carlin, who at the time was, was pretty cutting edge for a comedian, pretty hot at the time. But uh, I wasn't aware until I read your book that it says that um, John wanted Groucho Marx <laughs> and also Henry Kissinger to be on the show. Can you, ima- can you imagine John with Groucho Marx? <laughs> can you find two sharper minds? That would have been even more of a milestone than you know what it turned out to be. Um, and actually, it's funny because there was a letter, a collection that came out recently uh, of letters Lennon had written, one of them was to a friend complaining that, you know, they were giving him grief about his guests on the Mike Douglas show, and yet Douglas wrote a whole chapter saying we gave him everyone he wanted and had never bent over like that before. Well, actually, I guess it, it's all perspective. In your book, it's, it says that um, John was actually upset that there were too many conventional guests for the show. Yeah. Yeah, I think Stephen Eady, um, Louis Nye, an old comedian, you know, old school comedian. Yeah, he would have turned it into you know, even more than what it was. Um, but you're right, you know, the the David Frost appearance was fascinating that he got into that long debate with two people in the audience about Attica and you know prisoner rights. And then on the Cabot show, you had the groundbreaking, again, on network. He insisted on singing Woman is the Nigger of the World instead of a Beatles song or Imagine or anything else and got away with it. Mm -hmm. And good for Cabot for uh, sticking with it, even if he had to read a disclaimer not offending anyone. And today we're so hypersensitive about the world. I wonder about that word. People are getting in trouble left and right for saying it. Mm-hmm. And the NFL just passed. A, a, yeah, you get fined in the NFL if you use that word on the field. Um, one of uh, John Lennon's um, former uh, employees uh, said he thought John was a closet Republican, huh. and that was and that uh, was um, that was a story that was included in uh, the Beatles stories DVD a few years ago. I'm wondering what you thought of that uh, opinion. If you agree with that? Well, it's interesting. Cause I've also, and especially since doing this book, I've also heard a number of people who believe that the Republicans and CIA had Lenin killed. So I wonder if there's either conspiracy theory or on the part of the Republicans uh, 
wish fulfillment or so. You know, I, I don't, there's no evidence that he was turning conservative. Uh, the only, you know, when he was coming back, Double Fantasy, it was a nice album about a guy turning 40 who loved his wife and loved his kid and had realized that if you want peace in the world, you have to find peace in yourself. But I suspect the core values hadn't changed and he would have remained on the side of, you know, peace is better than war and love is better than hate. So I, you know, somebody had said that. I don't see any real evidence to prove it, but I think he would have remained consistent to his core values. Yeah. Could I just backtrack a bit uh, when you were talking about woman is the nigger of the world and you were saying how people today in the media have to be careful to use that word. Even now, when the one-to-one concert is broadcast on television and very often VH1 Classic in this country runs it, they always bleep out that word. Mm-hmm. And it's so many years later. I mean, it's 40 years later and it's like nothing has changed. Well, and it, it, some would say it's a hypersensitivity or simply how it's used. I think, and I can certainly, it's consistent with Lennon that he just, let's talk about it. And on the Dick Cavett show, he read a definition of the term that was written by an African-American congressman, Ron Dellums. Hmm. Um, and it's a shocking term. And, you know, I talked to Dellums about it for this book and, and had some great insights on it. At the time, there were only 13 African-Americans in all of Congress. And, you know, here comes Lennon saying, let's talk about what we mean by the word. What's, you know, and we need to do that. And I don't know. I, I think it's better if we can talk about some things rather than just pretend nobody's thinking it. And we, uh, the word's been co-opted and changed. We'll see. Hmm. Lennon never lost his ability. <laughs> One thing I thought was fascinating about the uh, people have asked, you know, what would Lennon make of social media or, you know, the Internet and all this. Well, a lot of radio stations in 72 would not play Woman is the Nigger of the World. They were free. They would free, especially the FM stations were playing songs with harsher language, but they wouldn't play that one. So Lennon had Apple set up a phone number you could call in and listen to the song kind of like on-demand media well that's ahead of its time right there yeah it is you know check out now and said if you want to hear it here it is not bad yeah i just uh i want to bring up one thing in your book because you bring up elvis presley who for a while there i, I know we've all seen the photo of him posing with president nixon and I guess he evidently was a fan of the president, but it actually says here that he had a memorandum in which he said that the Beatles had been a force for anti-American spirit. Yeah, was that? I mean, it was same reaction. You know, we've all seen the photo, and it's one of the great cultural moments of the century, probably. You know, just such an odd photo. But there was that memo about the meeting written by. Eagle Bud Crow, and you know Presley spent half his Oval Office time whining, complaining that the Beatles were un-American, that they came from England, made all their money, and went back to England to badmouth America. <laughs> it's kind of sad uh, and funny in a way, but yeah, I didn't realize also the, you know, I'd heard that. Elvis collected badges, and he wanted an honorary drug enforcement agency badge, which he got. But he had offered to the president that he would infiltrate the hippies, the Black Panthers, and others, all of whom he considered un-American. Well, it's shocking. <laughs> yeah, especially especially in light of you know, oh, it's just, yeah, it's just crazy. It really is. I mean, Elvis has covered Beatles songs. Yeah, he did. So in his own way, he is he supports their music, or supported their music. He was a character. So I guess well, a few artists, you know, and name are an artist who never covered a Beatles song, I guess. I imagine there was a love-hate thing. You know, Elvis felt 
the hippies had left them behind. And actually, a lot of the rock pioneers took them years to make kind of a comeback. You know, from the 50s, Chuck Berry kind of struggled with that, um, went out of fashion for a bit, and then had to reclaim what they started. Hmm. Hmm. So you think it's all kind of out of bitterness because of the Beatles' success? It sounded that way, you know, that they, for him to even mention they came over and made all their money and went back to England, you know, it kind of indicates they had stolen his fan base, which they had. Hmm. Or he let it go. You know, I mean, Elvis turned, you know, a little strange, and, and the fame got to him in a lot of ways. The fame got to Michael Jackson in a lot of ways. And I always found it admirable. The Beatles seemed a lot more grounded and because there were four of them together through it. Right. It was not a front man with backup singers that stayed in a cheap hotel. No, they were, they, they were very much, they kept each other in check, John and Paul, certainly. That's a good point. Yeah. Steve? I've, I think I've covered it, uh, pretty much everything I wanted to say, although I, I, I will say that for anybody that you know is not familiar with this period um, of Lennon's life, your book does a great job, and it really is a. It's almost a necessary reading because of the fact that you know we have ten, really tended to gloss over this a lot and kind of dismiss it, but there was really it, it was really quite important in, in the whole scheme of things because it was a very you know it was a very distinctive part of Lennon's personality. And because Yoko is basically carrying that work today, you know, she's still very much the activist. And, you know, this is where it all was, you know. I mean, she was an activist before that, but this is, you know, she, she's kind of living that spirit from this whole period now. And, um, it's it, you know, this is where a lot of it really happened. And to, to read through that again is very interesting. You did a great okay. job there. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And that's what struck me. It was, was, you know, as strong as the Beatles are as an image, uh, an identity, uh, an entity, you know, Lennon's solo is sort of equally so, but it's separate from music. It, it's Lennon wearing a New York T-shirt with a denim jacket, just looking cool. And what it stands for is the peaceful activism that get-involved kind of thing that Yoko is carrying on. Mm -hmm. Even though Yoko has been subjected to every conceivable insult for, <laughs> you know, the better part of 30 years, she, she held her head up high and continued doing it. And that, too, was consistent with mine. And what I said earlier about the Beatles not getting too weird, you know, Lennon, as a young man, you know, had a lot of, tragedy was sometimes bitter or whatever, but even when the fandom rebelled against him over the bigger than Jesus, you know, thing, he turned around and wrote All You Need Is Love. And you get a lot of pop stars, a lot of artists, a lot of you know, who would give the finger to the fans, who who would get bitter or, or withdraw, but they didn't. You know, and Lennon stayed the course with it. When he had the bed-ins for peace, he, they called them weird, they called them this, they called them that. Actually, it was great media manipulation, and he was just trying to sell an idea. And I think he was ahead of his time by doing yeah, absolutely. so. Absolutely. But my question to you is, how do you think, outside of John's fans and the Beatle fans, the general public looks back at uh, John's political work? Was he... A strong figure politically, or was he more weak and maybe naive? A strong figure, you know, there's a whole generation coming up that has a really powerful image of Lenin, you know, in their heads. And they, they're they not as familiar, they don't know all the songs, you know, the way we do, <laughs> they don't know all the lyrics. Um, but yeah, he fought for peace if it comes down to a simple term. As far as would some have thought him naive, I think that softens over time because he was on the right side of a lot of issues or a lot of what people, you know, most people tend to think 
you know, our positive values are, are, are sincere, at least that way. He was not necessarily, you know, that in-depthly uh, familiar with complicated issues. Not that he couldn't have gotten them. He was very intelligent. But things like out of state that came up, you need, you need a little more in depth. And I think, you know, as time goes on, he would have, he certainly laid the blueprint. And as we said, ahead of his time, whether it's media manipulation, what you see today, whether it's Bono or, or Geldof or Angelina Jolie, they not only get involved, they get aware. They, they make informed decisions up to very high levels at times. And let him lay the blueprint for that. Now, we, we actually talked about this in, in my interview privately with you, but wouldn't you say that before, John, that the folk people like Pete Seeger and Peter Paul and Mary and Joan Baez, they were very involved with civil rights and protests, weren't they pretty much on the same level? Well, they were on the same uh, wavelength in terms of the message, absolutely. Um, and folk had always, you know, opened that up, but it was it was basically unprecedented for someone of that commercial success level, of that pop star level, to turn around and be a street troubadour type of thing. And to be, you know, as much as Pete Seeger certainly had his following, but it was nowhere near as widespread. Nobody had the access to you know, what Nixon was worried about uh, to so many and so powerfully, you know, as Lennon. It, the folk singers didn't make an entire generation wear their hair a certain way or not to that extreme or that extent. And every change the Beatles made, an entire generation followed. And musicians. And he, in, in a way, he, you know, Dylan helped do it as well, but Pierre Paul and Mary and Joan Baez, uh, folk began bleeding into the pop world. As I said, it wasn't just, you know, it, I pointed out to someone else, I think we were talking, you look at the top ten, and it didn't matter if it was country, blues, R&B, Motown, or pop, everybody was thinking about Vietnam then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well, James, we, we had a great time talking with you about uh, John's political life. And we wish you much success with this new book. Again, it's called The Walrus and the Elephants, John Lennon's Years of Revolution. And it's available where? Well, pretty much everywhere. Uh, most of the chain bookstores, it's available on Amazon or through the distributor uh, Random House as a page or at sevenstories.com. Okay, and for those of you who just can't get enough of James, and I'm sure there are many of you, uh, you can read... Steve's Q&A with James on Beatles Examiner. And uh, you can also listen to my interview with him on my website at kenmichaelsradio.com on the More Interviews page. So, James, thanks so much for being a great guest. And uh, Thank you, James. This has been a great, a great uh, discussion. And uh, uh, Thank you both. Uh, enjoyed it very much. This is a fascinating period in John's life, and uh, we'd love to have you back sometime in the future to, to talk about it more. All right, I'd look forward to it. All right, that was great having James A. Mitchell with us. His new book, again, is called The Walrus and the Elephants, John Lennon's Years of Revolution. I'm Ken Michaels. Thanking you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying, had a great discussion with James A. Mitchell, and uh, we will see you next time.